Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with us here today. I really appreciate you. So grateful that we get to take this time together every week to up level, to be the better person that we can be and the better that we can be in business. Today, like all others, I have some really great opportunities for you to hear from some dynamic guests that are going to share with you some things they do in the world that you may want to take advantage of and learn how to uh, either start your own business if you don't already have one or up-level the business that you do have from what they do. Really powerful messages. I want to give a shout out to those of you that are the first time joining us. Thanks for being here with us. Thriving Entrepreneur is a place where you can thrive in your life and business. I bring to you best-selling authors and uh, really dynamically powerful business people that share with you about their life and their business and help give you insights. So I'm really glad to have you here. I do want to let you know that my friend Errol, multi-billionaire Errol Abramson, who has started and successfully created and sold or bought out and up-leveled 47 businesses with zero failures. And he is offering to be your business coach at a rate that, honestly, it's so ridiculously low that um, you couldn't hire a brand new newbie to coach you. And Errol wants to do two calls a week with you for an hour and be available to you. Now, available to you via email. Now, you need to understand that, A, his time is limited, and B, that this is a very exclusive offer. So there's only just a space for just a couple. Um, so if you are interested, reach out to me um, and let me know, and we'll we'll talk in further detail. Um, I also have been talking to you about the Complete Man Summit that I'm honored to be one of the speakers at. Uh, the information here in the next week or so will come out for where you can, uh, you know, actually get part of both the live as well as you can even buy and get. Um, you know, rights to be able to watch and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch the videos that are in there. So many powerful, uh, amazing speakers that are really going to do some important things in the world. So keep an eye open for that. As soon as I have more specific information, I will be posting it for you. So again, thanks for being here with us as today we really focus in on, um, you know, some business concepts that are so dynamically powerful um, that whether you own a business or you're wanting to start a business, you know, there are some things that are both A, business concepts that you really do want to think about, you know, maybe this is the right thing for me, as well as um, some really foundational kind of things that, uh, you know, that you really need to know in order to have your business be the most powerful and impactful. Um, here's what I can tell you. Uh, what starts out right ends up right. And what starts out wrong may never get right. Um, often, if you found that you're doing something that you started out wrong, probably what you're going to have to do is stop. Now, it seems counterintuitive, and I'm not talking about necessarily declaring bankruptcy or not having a business at all or whatever, but you need to stop, evaluate, regroup, and then completely restart, possibly even to the extent of doing a complete brand new relaunch of your business. Maybe you even need to go so far as to change the name of the business or even the structure of the business to something that better serves you. 
I don't know, I'm not inside of your business, but if what you did started out wrong and you're still in that same space, you need to stop, take some time, reevaluate what's working and what isn't, allow everything to be on the table. There can be no holy cows, no, um, you know, pet projects, none of those kind of things. You need to just genuinely and preferably with, um, you know, other voices besides your own, having an equal say and helpful vote in what's going on to be able to really prioritize. These are the things that are both making us money as well as worth pursuing. And the rest of the things we need to really be willing to let them go. You know, maybe there's some residual things that, you know, they make enough money that they're, they make sense to keep. Or maybe they need to be kept in a different sort of way. I, I, I'm not inside your business, so I can't tell you that off the cuff. But I can tell you that until every single thing you do in a failing or in a started out wrong kind of business, until every single one of those is on the table and possible to be something that you are willing to release. Until you're at that point, you really need to reevaluate more and realize that that one thing you're protecting probably is the sore spot. So I'll give you a real world example to that. Have you ever gotten, I don't know, like a thorn under your skin or something like that? You see, the thing about it is it's human nature that if somebody, you know, like even say when you were a kid, um, if you had a splinter underneath your skin or whatever, and your mom came to help you, um, when she touches it, you recoil. It's, it's a natural reaction that, you know, when somebody touches something that's painful, we pull back. We don't want to feel pain, right? Often, when you find yourself resisting, that may be the thing that is the thorn in your business rather than the shining star in your business. Because the shining star, you'll be willing to go to any business coach, any team meeting, whatever. And you'll be willing to let that be on the table and be critiqued because it's a shining star. I mean, think about whatever genre of music you like and whoever you think is the best. Um, let's not get in the debate of who is or who isn't. But think about how amazingly talented you think they are. The thing about it is, is, is that if somebody else comes up to you and says, oh, I don't like that singer, doesn't really impact how much you like them. Not even if it's somebody super close to you. Um, I know people that have actually even gotten out of relationships because of, you know, the fact that the person didn't like a particular artist that they really liked. I'm not promoting that, but I'm just saying that things that are really, truly getting done, things that are profitable, productive, that are the shining stars in your life, in your business, those things, they'll hold up. They can stand up to scrutiny. And if, when they're being critiqued, if some things come out, finding those things will only make that shining star better. It will only up-level what is working to an even greater level. The things that you're talented at only get better when we use our talents more, when we refine our skills, when we practice doing it the right way. Because, you know, practicing the wrong thing, it isn't just purely practice that makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. And the closer we get to doing it the optimal way, the better that we will get in having the optimal outcome. So we put all those things on the table and we really allow ourselves to reboot and start over. Now, 
the other side to that that I said way back is what starts out right ends up right. And so if you take the time to evaluate what are my strengths and weaknesses, what are the things that I can do and should do in the world, what is that special, unique gift that I have to bring to the world, and how can I use it the most impactfully, the most powerfully to help the people that I know I'm meant to serve. When we do that, and then we find ways to really truly release that, that's so powerful. That's starting off your business right. All the other ideas, all the great entrepreneurs that I can bring to you that are going to share with you great business concepts, ways to manage your money, ideas for business ventures, people that you need to learn from, they're only as good as you are being true to yourself and maximizing the skill that you have, the talent innately often that is within you until you are willing to get real with yourself and say to yourself, you know, this is the thing I'm good at and well, I'm not so great at this other thing. We have to be okay with both of those. We have to be all right acknowledging that nobody's good at 100% of things, but also nobody's bad at 100% of things either. And as we hone in and we discover what our talents are, as we listen to podcasts and radio shows, and we listen to TED Talks, and we read books, we begin to allow experts to help us shine light on us. You see, there's two ways of listening to an expert interview or reading a powerful book. Option A is you can uh, see how amazing Oprah is and want to be the next Oprah. The truth of the matter is, is not that there isn't a void there, but Oprah did Oprah. She handled being Oprah dynamically and powerfully. What the world needs is not Oprah part, you know, 2.0. What the world needs is the next thing that is dynamic and powerful, fills that space that was left in a unique and brilliant way versus, um, you know, being just a clone of that. And so it's important that when we're, you know, listening to these things, that we're not listening to them and getting inspired to be them, but rather inspired by what they are teaching and the fundamentals that underlie even the things that aren't something we're going to do that are universal and that help us be the best version of ourselves. That's the better way to go. We don't want to we don't want to imitate, we want to emulate. We don't want to clone ourselves in the image of somebody else. We want to allow what they do to illuminate how amazing you are. I hope that you can embrace that. I hope that you can take in deeply the amazing, incredible talent that you are. So that then today or any other of the episodes, as I bring powerful professionals that are getting it done in, a, in really fun, dynamic, and unique ways in their business, that you will find yourself up-leveling what you do, your unique brilliance, the thing that you have to share with the world, that these guests will allow that to be illuminated in you. And you will be able to really, truly show up in a wonderfully exciting, dynamically powerful way. After all, whether you're working for a corporation or you have your own company, showing up in the world as the best version of yourself is the best way I can think of to live as a thriving entrepreneur. I want that for you. I hope you want it for you too. 
We're going to take our first commercial break and then be back with our guests here on Thriving Entrepreneur. Don't go away. You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? Over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to WeHelp. YouThrive.com. Check us out and find out how you can be a best selling author today. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today as we dive deep into some really good examples of things that you can start in a business add to your business or do to up-level your business. I really want you to take some notes from these experts and really see what you can do to really up-level where you are currently in this moment, just like this. Investing, especially in short-term rentals, is something that is so hot right now. And I don't know about you, but I'm really intrigued to get some insider information on it. So to help us with this today, I'm joined by Jay Massey, and he's going to talk about some powerful things he's learned about branding, building, and really having an effective short-term rental business. Join me in welcoming Jay Massey. Hey, Jay, how are you today? I am excited to be here and uh, grateful at the same time. Great. So tell us a little bit about your background and what got you to this point in life. So what happened is that, uh, like every other entrepreneur, real estate is a solution to a problem. Our problem was that my wife, when she's pregnant, she has a condition known as a hyperemesis. She could not eat or drink. I had a hole in my lung. I could not walk and talk simultaneously while speaking. So we needed a way to earn an income without necessarily physically going to work. And real estate has been the answer. Then specifically, when it comes to short-term rentals inside the real estate world, having processed and done thousands of transactions in various different forms, from land deals to commercials to cell phone towers, knowing that um, the best way to generate income and build wealth at the same time it, it's ultimately short-term rentals because most people don't know, but real estate's a horrible income building strategy when done the traditional way. Why is that? Why does, um, I mean, you always see all these commercials on TV. Why does traditional real estate not really build income? Yeah, it, it builds wealth, not income. So what I simply mean by that is typically for the pre-retirement stage. So if you're in the pre-retirement stage or you're trying to build something for your family, uh, you, you can't count on the passive income when you still have a loan on the property. Now, that's not me saying go pay cash for the property. That's not I'm not saying that at all, because what you must do is build your asset base so that later you can withdraw or, or live on the interest that those assets are producing. And in this particular case, um, the dividends are known as rent, right? Well, most of the rent when you have the mortgage on it is going to go to well, the debt service. Until that's done, you have to choose between deferred maintenance because you want to ha you have to upkeep the property and provide a good quality product or cash flow. And that's really what ends up happening for most people until the loan's gone. So for somebody who maybe has been living under a rock or doesn't understand the term, <laughs> <laughs> explain to somebody what the concept of a short-term rental is. Got it. Um, I like to look at the two retail stores or the two uh, stores. If you if you can understand the difference between, say, Costco and Sam's Club, 
versus say Target and Walmart, then you, if you understand those two stores and how they operate differently, it, it's the same thing. So when you are doing your traditional real estate, that person, that uh, landlord is typically leasing or shall I say selling uh, 365 days at a time on a 30 day payment plan. So you pay every 30 days, but you've contracted for 365 of them. Uh, the short term rental person is saying, okay, well, we will sell you as little as one day at a time and you will pay for the time, just the time that you uh, desire to actually physically uh, possess the property. And that's where the efficiency is. You know, it's just like a, you can take a vending machine for, for that example, right? You can go to Costco and you know what you do? You buy a whole bunch of water in a case and then you repackage that, put it inside a vending machine, refrigerate it and put it somewhere convenient where the customer needs it. And what you paid $5 for for the entire case is now $1.50 per bottle inside your vending machine and you get to keep the money in the middle. It's the exact same concept just applied to space. Perfect. All right. So for somebody that's interested in getting into it, uh, you know, I suppose you have to have great credit and a whole bunch of money to be able to get started. No. And that's probably why knowing what I know today, because you've got to understand when I got started in real estate, I had a credit score of 398. We had no money. Zero would have been like a step up. Um, what has happened is because of the way short-term rentals work, it, it creates an uncommon opportunity when you apply all of the creative real estate acquisition techniques and things that I am aware of, really. And it, because what it comes down to is most people think you have to own the property. Well, no, you have to have control over the property and the right to sell the use. And that was the key, which is allowing individuals, I mean, we've had individuals straight out of high school. We have individuals who are currently unemployed or just laid off. We, we have individuals who have full-time jobs and, and kids and all the soccer game to boot being able to make this transition because this is what I now call the gateway drug to the rest of the real estate world because you gain the experience, you get to expand a portfolio, and you get to build the income along the way so that you can then, yeah, own property long term. So you're basically the marketing company for a house owner and you're going to take all the hassle of renting out that place for a day or two um, and let them deal with upkeep and maintenance and servicing the debt on the loan. Kind of, but not really. It's more like mm -hmm. I become the permanent tenant and whether it's a house, it could be land. Uh, the, the, the type of real estate that you use, I mean, it could even be swampland. We, we talk about some of these ideas and, and crazy things that, that can come up with. So it can be an apartment building. I mean, it could be an industrial space. It, the, the type of property isn't as important as much as the landlord has now me or rather my company as the tenant. That's basically what ends up happening is that you become the tenant to the landlord and you're going to pay them their wholesale rate just like you would, you know, at Costco. Costco is satisfied that you paid them whatever you paid them for the case of water. So we're, that, from the landlord perspective, that part's going to stay the same. And then the operator in the middle, what they're going to do, yeah, they're going to spend a lot of time creating an experience on that piece of real estate for someone else to enjoy in smaller increments because you, because you did charge a, you know, you have your fees for your rent and expenses and all that other stuff. So we're going to add furniture to it. We're going to probably paint it and just, who knows, but we're going to design a space for a specific type of person. And then once we've done that, then we're going to do the marketing, yes, to attract them. Sometimes they're corporate, sometimes they're hospital. We've identified 45 different use cases. Most people tend to think if I don't live in a sunshine state or have some sort of vacation um, you know, component to where I am, I can't do it. And that's just not true. I was just getting ready to ask you that because, you know, you mentioned it could be swampland. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd yeah. love to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. It, it's, it's really, it's really straightforward. 
most people, especially when I say the words real estate, they think the real estate is the thing. And, and that's not true. It's the experience at the piece of real estate. So how do you plan on using that piece of real estate? I say swampland because somewhere in Florida right now, there's a guy, and for the sake of a lack of a better name, let's call him Bob. Bob's got an airboat, he lives out there, and he's got a, a, a shack right next to where he lives, and he could give you an experience and help you and introduce you to a whole bunch of alligators. In fact, he probably knows them by name and can you know take give you a tour. And if he charged you, $250 per person per night to do that. There's somebody out there who do it. And it has, and it's in the middle of Swampland. Now, I have no desire to be that person, but somebody does. And Bob can learn to attract people and let people know that, hey, I'm over here. Now, that's what has happened. Technology has made it such that the independent would-be entrepreneur can do that. It's an option. Before it wasn't, it just wasn't. And now it's so efficient that the market has become efficient to the point to where we can. So my guess would be that more than anything, what you're going to teach in your class is how to know what place you want to be the permanent tenant uh, at so that you right. know, people are, you know, marketing out the right thing. So, yeah, and, and that's where the whole idea, like you were talking about, uh, the branding, et cetera, comes in. Because until you know who you want to serve, you have no clue what type of property would work. Because I, I'll have people come and ask me all the time, well, what about, what about a condo? What about uh, a studio? What about a four-bedroom house? And the answer is, yeah, they work. And then in, in the, and until you've decided who you're going to serve, I can't say no, because there's no way to say no. There's no way to create a repeatable, predictable system until you've chosen to intentionally uh, uh, disinclude certain people. So it's no different than when you say you want to open a restaurant. You can't say, I'm just going to open a restaurant. I mean, one of the first questions you have to ask is like, what's on the menu? What type of food is it? You know, and, and until you do, you, you don't know which direction to go. Do I need a walk or just a normal frying pan? Well, it kind of depends, you know, which could we, and that's really where I'm coming from. This is no different. And what we do is, yeah, we walk people through the process of understanding uh, up usually three different types of customers to serve and helping them think through what that means in terms of beds and linens and televisions and electronics and access control and safety and security and the maintenance teams and the cleaning and the, all the things it takes to make it work. So now before somebody runs right out and just grabs a piece of property without doing that thing you just said. Which is what they normally uh, do right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Go yeah, ahead. absolutely. So before they do that, um, mm -hmm. you know, what do you do to protect yourself? Because, I mean, you're going to be signing on the bottom line that I'm going to pay X amount for rent, whether, right. you know, when somebody gets it 31 days out of the month or it's empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're running a proper system, you should not have. I mean, you should routinely be able to beat what the hotels publish as their occupancy rate. I mean, our, uh, our students do uh, because they're, they're following a, a very predictable system. And I, because I think if I'm not mistaken, in 2019, the hotel published like 66 or 67 percent occupancy. Um, I tell people you should easily beat that by 12 to 15 points all, all day long when you're just following uh, the process. So you, you shouldn't be experiencing extreme vacancy unless you have like really, really extreme weather, extreme cold or extreme heat. Um, but then there's still a plan and way to make that work. So it, it's mostly about understanding who it is that you want to serve. That's your, that is your downside protection is understanding how to look at, in some cases, the place where you have lived your entire life uh, how to look at it differently with different eyes to go, okay, great. There is an opportunity here. We had one lady in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, who thought she was going to be helping people and, and families visiting their children at school. And it turns out she learned, and again, I, I, for me, right along with her, that the rodeo is huge, like all year round. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay great and that's just what's happened for her 
and she's been able to provide clean, safe, affordable housing to those individuals who are coming to the rodeo. I mean, in a lot of cases, you won't know. Uh, you'll have an idea, but the rodeo for those individuals, that's still business travel. And it's just interesting. Interesting. Now you got me thinking, you know, because I live in a city that's, you know, that it phrases itself as being the avocado capital of the world. Um, it's okay. here in Southern California. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a subculture of people who would travel to Southern California just to, I don't know, buy and experience avocados other than the one week we have a festival every year? <laughs> exactly. And, that, and And that's what ends up happening. A lot of people end up learning. I had no idea that this even existed and it's been here for how long? And, and, and then you start to plan for those people to come every year or every month or however frequently they are. You learn a lot about what's going on in your own uh, geographic area when you begin to take this on because people are coming, they're coming for a reason. They've always been coming for a reason, but now you have a reason to know, to care and, and to serve them. But until you decide you know who it is that you want to serve uh, that being the key you, you don't know because there's just too many options there's so many choices of of equipment and what to use and how to make it all work together that can uh, that derails a lot of people so absolutely a person needs to join your system in order to avoid the pitfalls but before we jump into that is there you know like some kind of criteria that a person can figure out is this something that's right for me? Um, what do you mean? Well, like, what's step one? It's step one for step one is literally figuring. We have a worksheet. It's about forty-five different questions of trying to figure out who it is that you want to serve. Like, and keywords being want. Uh, now, the easiest person to serve is the person you are most like. That's what I tell everybody to start with. Is start with the things you like. And I'll give, let me give you some easy, easy examples. Um, so <laughs> here you go. Did, did, have you ever gone to uh, travel and stayed somewhere and had the frustration of uh, you paid for the upgraded Wi-Fi, but it still didn't feel upgraded and you couldn't get connected to it? You ever had that feeling? Oh, yes. <laughs> exactly. So that means in your location, the one one thing you're going to make sure that happens is the Wi-Fi works. And I know it sounds crazy, but that is a very, very basic thing. However, for those of you who are like, no, nah, I don't care about Wi-Fi, because there are some people who want an experience, because we'll get like artists and um, writers for sure, who are looking for those places to where they can be, quote unquote, disconnected. Uh, and they're, they're not overly concerned about Wi-Fi at that moment, which I'm like, okay, great. But understand that, that that's one of the simple things to consider regarding the customer you want to serve. Do they value Wi-Fi or not? And if so, how fast? Does that even matter to them? Because there are, because even if you do value Wi-Fi, there are some people who only want the fastest kind. And there's some who just like, hey, just as so long as it works, I'm good. And you just, you know, that's just one of, of many. Another one, like for me, uh, I'm taller than average and I get tired of hanging off the bed to be honest, <laughs> everywhere I go. So all of our units by default have king size beds. It, you don't have to ask, it's just king size. That's just the way we do it. And we therefore attract individuals who appreciate that, which often is a lot of salespeople, sometimes sports professionals, etc. And again, that it's strategic because you can't, can you use a queen size? Of course you can use a queen or a twin and all these other things but we've decided who we want to serve. So when it comes down to understanding things like your startup cost, my startup cost for, specifically because I'm using a king size bed uh, might be a little bit more, but I also know that the person who appreciates that might be willing to pay a little bit more too. So it all washes out, but at the end of the day, you've got to know your customer. And when you do, it makes it really easy. Do I need board games or not? And it depends. Most of our units don't have board games at all. We do have one intentionally, but most of them don't because they don't all need them. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So for people who want to dive deeper on this with you, um, how can they get in contact with you? 
the easiest thing to do because when individuals want to get involved in the real estate world what i've learned is that they just typically say i just want real estate they don't really have a goal behind it they don't understand so what i like to do is give people a target what i mean by that is we've created a calculator that will tell you how many short-term rental units you need in order to retire so that maybe that becomes your first target so you can go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash how many units again that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash how many units put in your information it's going to spit out it's going to say you need this many two bedrooms or three bedrooms this many apartment units in order to reach your goal and there you go at least that'll get you started in the right direction and thinking like well how can i get my first seven units because that that could be the that could be the number for you in order for you to reach a retirement uh, position and just so you know seven units inside of 12 months is a very very doable thing that's so interesting um, well, I'm looking forward to it. I already brought that URL up on my computer to look at in more depth. Um, Jay, I really appreciate you spending time on the show here with us today. Thank you. Uh, it's been fun. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with you some options for really making money in powerful new ways that you know, maybe even three or four years ago weren't options, but are becoming more and more powerful. And I hope that you will look into how can I best make use of, uh, you know, the opportunities that are available out in the world today. Because with that, it allows you to live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. And that's what we all want, isn't it? We're going to take a quick break. And then we'll be right back on Thriving Entrepreneur. You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? Over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to wehelpyouthrive.com, check us out, and find out how you can be a best-selling author today. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. Let's jump into our next interview with another great expert who's going to talk to us about some of the key fundamentals we need when starting our business or in our business to really have the greatest and best success that we can have in all that we do in business. All right, we are here again to talk about your wealth, but here's my question for you. Do you have a black belt in wealth? Or, you know, are you like the little kids running around who, you know, they're using a piece of string to hold their gi together because they <laughs> haven't even joined the class yet? <laughs> Wherever you're at, there are some solutions for you. And I'm joined today by best-selling author, Damian Lupo. He's going to talk to us about how to really get a handle on our finances and create some wealth in our life. Damian, thanks for being here with us today. Hey, Steve, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm actually kind of laughing because I went to Japan a couple of years ago to train at the home of Aikido. And when I was there, I had a pair of pants where the string, it wasn't quite working. And so my pants were falling off the entire time. So your comment there just cracked me up thinking about that experience with my pants falling off. <laughs> Perfect. So tell us a little bit about who you are and your background in finance. So I'm, I'm a, if, if you summed it up, I'm a financial teacher. I, I started off buying rental houses and things back when I was barely old enough to drink alcohol uh, about 20 years ago and did it without really a college education. And I just went out there and I bled in the streets. I just, I learned how to do what I do 
investing wise and building businesses by being out in the, in the streets doing it. I built 50 different businesses. And, you know, in the process of doing that, one of the things I can tell you is that it, when you do a bunch of stuff, most of it doesn't work and you learn by it and you grow and that's what true wealth is. And it's because of that, that I teach now with that wisdom. It's not that I read a book and I'm teaching what I read, but it's actually, I'm teaching and sharing what I've done and what I've learned through the school of hard knocks and the university of getting the crap kicked out of me. So a lot of people, especially newer entrepreneurs, um, you know, they have a dream, they have a vision. I think all of us want to be rich. You know, I don't know that I've ever met anybody that's like, you know what? I really want to be as poor. <laughs> well, I've met some of my kids that would rather just live in my house, but that's a different story. <laughs> right. Um, what is, you know, what is kind of the starting place to really creating true wealth in your life? Well, I think that one of the things we need to really understand is that it, it's about the freedom of choice and more money isn't better. It's just more and truly more money creates other problems. Uh, it's sometimes being broke is simpler and easier and less stressful than having a lot of money. I've had both, no money, negative money, negative 5 million when I crashed in 2008. And I've had many, many, many tens of millions and I prefer the wealth. I, and what, what we need to know is that if you're just doing it for the money, you're on the wrong track, pure and simple, wrong track. If your money is a tool, it's a great tool to allow you to do things, to have a life, to, to contribute. And so the first question is, why the heck are you putting all this effort into something that is, is it for the money or is it for contribution? Is it for security for your family? And I think a lot of people miss that. They just go to work and they're not actually asking the question before they start. It, it's what I talked about in my book, Unicornomics, that came out last year. The first 15% of your business is the thinking you do before you pull the trigger. And it's one of the biggest things is why the heck am I doing this? Is it just for the money? Because money will not make you happy. It will accelerate who you already are. And I see a lot of people making a ton of money and they've struggled. They make a ton of money and they turn into absolute jerks. And sometimes their, their evil comes out and, and it's because they never really got clear on a mission, a foundation, a rationale as to why they're putting all this energy into something that's going to potentially be a machine. Now, it's important to note you refer to your budding entrepreneurs, budding wealthy individuals as unicorns. Can you give us uh, what your definition for unicorn is? Yeah, the, the old, old classic unicorn was a billion dollar company. We, we see this in Silicon Valley, companies that have a valuation of a billion, the Ubers, the, the Postmates, the Facebooks. That's what we classically know it to be. I believe that's changed. And when I talk about unicorns now, I'm talking about people that are thinking not of a billion dollars, but of a billion people. How are we going to serve a billion people? And to me, being a unicorn is, is about the impact you have. And it's a lot more fulfilling than just a bunch of cash. And, and really, truly, the cash is not what it's about. It's, it's, it's about the connection and the reason you're here. So I look at it differently. And, and I got that from Peter Diamandis, who I thought was brilliant when he said, being a billionaire is not about a billion dollars anymore. It's about a billion people being impacted. Now, I want to dive into that with you, even if this is a left turn at Albuquerque, because uh, I'm sure you hear this all the time when you're coaching people too. We have this great vision and we want to make sure that we reach everybody in the whole world. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that we reach that billion people one at a time. So when you're having a vision for a vision for billions, how do you stay focused? What you said is, is, is perfect. You're thinking about a person. Like when we were talking before we started recording, I was asking who are we talking to? And it's, it's the idea of having a vision of a person because a human being, there's compassion, there's emotion. If it's just a pile of numbers, if it's a spreadsheet, if your entire world is impacting a billion people because you have a really big spreadsheet, it's not as impactful. It's not, it's not going to drive you. And, and so it really does come down to the one person and you like we're talking right now, there's going to be hundreds, thousands, who knows, maybe millions of people that are going to listen to this. Each of those is a person. And when you're thinking about business, the question is that one person that I'm interacting with or that sees my stuff or that buys my product or whatever that person is, that's a person. And when you think of it that way, I think you change business. Too many businesses have, have narrowed down to becoming accounting spreadsheets and that's how they drive their, their formula. They try to automate everything. And in, in my businesses, it's high, high human touch. And it's almost, there's almost no competition because 
businesses out there have done a terrible job. They're getting worse at actually connecting with human beings. They just look at people as digits on a spreadsheet. And I think that that's a huge mistake, but it's also a huge opportunity for those of you listening that are thinking, how can I create a, be a there's, how, how do I have a market differentiator? You know what? Human touch, actually care about people, focus on relationships. Everything changes and you'll be the only one there. There won't be any competition. So velocity, you know, uh, escape velocity, breaking the gravity of all the other people around, you know, because most businesses fail. What are some fundamental things a person can do to really from the beginning create a company that's going to be profitable and generate true independence for them? One of the things is, is objective reality where you have to be pragmatic. You have to look at the market and, and inst- just because you love your thing doesn't mean anybody else cares. And one of the things that I see a lot of people do is they spend a ton of time dreaming up their thing and then they don't, never really ask, does anybody actually want to trade me money for this thing? And being rational about that, asking the market, what you know, do you care about this thing? And then following the lead of the market. It's better to have a handful of customers that have actually paid you getting feedback and then start developing or tweaking your stuff instead of spending years developing something that nobody actually cares about. I think that that's one of the things that we have to start with. And the other one that's huge is figuring out who is around you. The Many people have said this in many different ways. The way that I say it in Reinvented Life is that we have this, the Bucky Five after Buckminster Fuller. The five people that are around us, the most are going to influence us and form us, and ultimately we will become them. So if we're if we're around people that are supportive, that are out there creating wealth, that are paying a price to make something happen, it's going to become normal. If we have people that are naysaying, or we have the wrong toxic people in our company, the employees, whoever's around us, that is what our, our company is going to be. So I think we have to be really rational, and we have to be willing to eviscerate and slice and dice and cut and prod making sure that only the right people are around doesn't mean they're bad people that we're getting rid of. It just means they're bad for the mission. They're bad for the the formula to create wealth and to create this thing that actually works and is profitable. It brings up uh, one of the questions that kind of jumped off on your speaker one sheet. And that is this whole concept of who then are the two most important people uh, to hire right when you start off your company. Well, one of the people I think that is, is key is, uh, is your coach, your mentor, somebody that's going to help you see blind spots because as entrepreneurs, as business owners, we get all excited. We get wound up, we get emotional, we burn out and we miss things because we're just too close to the fire and having that person that is there simply to see what you can't see. It's like anybody in the world that's world-class, whether it's Tiger Woods or Michael Phelps or you know any sports person, any high level executive always has a board of directors. They always have a mentor. And it's not just somebody necessarily that has gone to a class that knows how to ask a couple of questions, but I prefer to have people that have been through the, the, the trenches. And I call those mentors. Coaches are a great first step. And then the next step is really the mentor. Having that person is key. The other person I think is, is very, very incredibly valuable is having an assistant that you can start offloading things immediately when you're starting. It doesn't take much. Uh, the, and maybe there's a third person because really if you don't have these three, you're in trouble. And that third person is the person that's watching your numbers. If you don't have clarity on your numbers, and this is common, I did this for two years when I started my real estate investing, I just th- basically threw everything in a shoebox and went crazy. And then I thought, oh my gosh, what, have I, what do I have? I have a mess. It, you got to have your numbers taken care of. People will often make an excuse that they don't have enough revenue, that a bookkeeper costs money. You can't run a business if you don't know what your numbers are telling you. Your numbers tell a story and the numbers don't lie. The numbers create the clarity that allows you to be powerful in making decisions without wondering, is this right? Your numbers will tell you the right answer. So you really have to have those three people. And if you're skimping out, don't skip out on those three. So for people that are listening live, um, as we're doing this recording, the stock market is going crazy. (laughs) Um, You know, it's had some huge drops and then a great gain and then a huge drop again. Um, What are some good investing strategies versus some of the craziness that investors are bringing to people. 
Well, one of the, here, here's the thing. If you're thinking you have to do something, you have to be investing because your cash is sitting there. That's a mistake. That's called FOMO. We do it. We see all these things on Facebook. We, we see all this stuff that we think we're missing out on and we do it with investing where instead of being okay, sitting there and studying a little bit and learning, we tend to throw money at anything. We, we listen to financial advisors who are mostly financial salespeople. Their, their, their job is to keep your money stuck in their system to get AUM, assets under management fees, indefinitely. If you can actually say, okay, what's in my best interest, then you'll be able to make better decisions. So what should you invest in? First thing is yourself. Make sure that you're clear. If you just hand your money off to people and you think it's all going to work out, you're smoking hopium. It is not a strategy I recommend because all you're going to end up with is a big pile of fees and a whole small pile that you really can't live on down the road. So when we're thinking about the markets and the chaos, I mean, it, it's up 5%, it's down 7%, it's, it's down 8%. You know, we're watching this stuff. This is going to go on for a while because we are in a bubble of everything and there are going to be opportunities mixed into it. It's not going to be possible to just throw a dart and hope it works out. You really have to spend time investigating and learning. How do you do that? You find people that have already been through it that can give you insights. Like we sometimes we'll, we'll throw out a video and we'll talk about what's going on in the market and our take on it and, and how things are going to impact people. Find those people that have messages that are not just selling something that are literally just giving you their, their decades worth of insight where they can look at a market and they can say, here's, here's my, here's what I believe is happening based on what I know and what I've been through. That's valuable. Not CNBC, not CNN, you know, not somebody trying to sell you some, some insurance, but truly people that are giving insights because they're studying it and they've lived it. So you went through a time, uh, you built 150 rental house, uh, you know, business, and then lost it all. <laughs> um, are you now back in the real estate market or is there somewhere else that you look for, you know, for investing now? So I've, I've got, I've got interest in, in real estate in, in projects where, um, I'm looking at things long term, and I, I don't really do anything short term anymore. I think there's a there's a a craze in this in this country, especially in the U.S., around short term flipping and people going in and out of apartments in three or four years. And I think that's a mistake. So what I tend to to invest in right now is things that are good for the next 20 years. It's very much a Warren Buffett or a Benjamin Graham approach to value investing, looking at fundamentals, figuring out is this is this apartment or is this mini storage going to be useful in this particular area 10, 20 years from now. That's how I invest because I can sleep at night. I don't care what happens in the economy. We know we're going to have breakouts like coronavirus. We know we're going to have market collapses. We know we're going to have all that stuff. The question is, are all the people going to go away? And the answer is no, not in certain places. Maybe in some places where the towns are dying because there's no jobs, but places like that I like, like Denver or a lot of Florida or you know, places where there's an, a robust economy, that's where I'm putting my efforts and interests. It's just focusing on those. And here's the key, Steve. It's, it's, not, it's not really as much about where as who. Who's going to actually drive these things? Who's going to execute? Because you can have a great idea with a bad operator and it's going to turn out terribly. Whereas if you have a decent idea or a decent deal and you've got somebody with experience, they will make it into a great deal. So it's really figuring out who. That is the core. It doesn't matter how sexy or, or splashy or shiny the object is. You got to figure out who's going to be driving that thing. So where's the pitfall? What, uh, you know, what is the thing that you found people do the most that ends up ultimately costing them the most? People are too anxious to pull the trigger on things. They go into things half baked and it's because they're concerned they're going to miss out on the deal. I see people throwing money at, at morons running real estate deals that have no experience and no track record and I'm watching those, that those dollars go away. It is hard. Real estate is not easy. There's a lot of people that teach it that I, I shake my head at that make it sound like it's just no big deal. You just go do it. I've done it. I've done it for decades. And uh, the people that are still doing it 20 years later are the ones that have unbelievable grit and tenacity and their, their resilience to keep going. It, it's not for the faint of heart. And I, I see a lot of people just so anxious to get their money working that they're throwing it at bad deals. And when you lose your money, or you lose 50% of it, it takes a long time to get it back. And the problem is not really getting it back because I lost $20 million for the properties and it, it wasn't going out and recreating it. The problem is most people that lose money 
don't have any education. They don't have any experience after it. So they don't have any idea how to do it other than, well, it took me 20 years to build up that, that big pile. I don't have 20 years again. What do I do? If you're going to do something, my, my best recommendation is to get actively involved and understand it at a core level. That's what's going to allow you to make better decisions. And when things go bad, which they do, you'll be able to go out and recreate the wealth instead of saying, oh, dang, I guess that didn't work. Okay, so for the person who, this is day one for them, you know, they've been living cash flow to cash flow, paycheck to paycheck, um, you know, they're basically employees inside of their business. They want to actually start investing. What is step one? What is the thing they should do first? The, the first thing I, I recommend is, is going to events with people that are actually doing it. This could be a meetup group. This could be a seminar. There's lots of good ones out there. And then there's lots of bad ones. But getting off your butt and going out there and talking to real people, what, what happens is we get a lot of information on the internet and we end up in an echo chamber where whatever we search for is all that we really see. And so we don't know that it's really reality. We might think it is, but it, it just it feeds on what we've already looked for. And it's the problem with a lot of our, the algorithms, whether it's Google or YouTube or Facebook. And so when you get out into the real world, you start talking to people and you start to understand, oh, okay, this is reality. It's not just, hey, I bought a house and now I'm rich because I flipped it and made 100000 and that's easy and it took me five minutes. You actually understand the intricacies and the time involved. So the, the first step is, is really going out there and, and being a part of groups and talking to people. There's lots of great books. Uh, one of the, f the fundamental books that most people have probably heard by now because it's been around for 23 years is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Really understand the basis of, basics of money and, and being an investor. And some of the, the stuff that we think is true is not true. Like rule number one, the rich don't work for money and your house is not an asset. Those are great fundamental ideas that are opposite of what we were taught. And they're going to blow up people's belief systems. So I think that's important to start with, to challenge what you believe is true. And, and don't, don't just think that you're right because you were told you were right by your parents or your teachers. You really have to challenge everything. If you're going to have a different life than you've had in the past, you're probably going to have to start thinking about things differently. And that starts by challenging the assumptions. Well, Damien, we have given people a lot of really great concepts, but there are some that I know are going to want to go deeper with you. How can a person get in contact with you to, to go deeper with you? Best thing to do is visit me at DamienLupo.com and you'll see some additional videos I've got on, on financial freedom and the books that I've written and just the, some of the commentary. If you want to hear more about what I think about the markets, how to survive them and thrive, the opportunities that are coming, DamienLupo.com is going to have a lot of useful information, additional things that I do that might be of interest and you can poke around and see what might be fit. And Damien is spelled D-A-M-I-O-N, Lupo, L-U-P-O. That's so it. So DamienLupo.com. Damien, I really appreciate you spending the time with us on the show here today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Hope everybody got a lot of value and I appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for the time and having me on. All right. Well, that just about wraps us up here for another exciting episode of Thriving Entrepreneur. I hope you got some great ideas for things that you can do to start a business or ways that you can up level your business and really go from where you are right now here today to that new, greater, better that is in store for you. There are so many cool things going on in the world, even in this moment right now. And I hope that you will be able to take advantage of them and share your unique brilliance with the world because the world does need you to live as a thriving entrepreneur. Until next time, have an amazing, great week. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? 
over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to wehelpyouthrive.com, check us out, and find out how you can be a best-selling author today.